Hey, welcome back everybody. Day 12, 21 days of fasting and prayer. Sometimes people think, what difference can a few days make? I'm going to tell you, it can make all the difference in the world. When you take something small and you present it to the Lord, like giving up meals so that you can spend some time pressing into Jesus, it can change your whole year. Just a few days of fasting and prayer can turn your situation around. It can cause you to have the breakthrough that you're after. It can ha- cause you to have the healing that your body needs, that your soul needs. It can turn around your financial situation, your relationships. This is what the scripture tells us throughout. A little bit can make a huge difference. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. What difference? What a difference a, a little bit can do. You might hear in the background some drumming taking place. We've got drum lessons going on because the world needs more drummers. That's for sure. In John chapter 6, we read this the other day in our devotional reading. At the gathering place, we read our Bibles every day. That's a culture we're establishing for followers of Christ. we got to hear his voice to follow him. We can't be lukewarm. We can't be those who are passive in our relationship and only listening to the word on Sunday mornings. We've got to be people who every day wait at the gates of the Lord, waiting for him to speak to us. We do that through the word. Every single day, we're filling our hearts and our minds with faith built uh, faith-filled teaching so that we can lay hold of the things for which God has laid hold of us. So when I was reading in John chapter 6 about the story of the feeding of 5,000, uh, a lot of things stood out to me. Have you ever um, have you ever asked that question like, what difference is this going to make? If I've only, I'm only able to give a little bit or do a little bit. Um, we only have a little bit and we need a lot. We need a huge change. We need a huge uh, windfall. And so we ask those questions. What good would this little bit that I'm doing uh, make? What kind of difference? And that's that's true both on the financial side, but it's also true in just any aspect of life when the challenge ahead of you seems to be so much bigger than what you've got within your reach. So in John chapter 6, Jesus He just finished ministering to people, and uh, I'll pick it up at verse 2. It says, Then a great multitude followed him because they saw the signs which he performed on those who were diseased. So they saw Jesus heal people who were diseased. Jesus is the healer. He was back then. He is today. And when he heals people, others take note of that, and it causes them to want something as well. They followed him because of that. And then it says in verse um For it says, now the Passover of the feast of the Jews was near, and then Jesus lifted up his eyes, and he saw a great multitude coming toward him. So he leans over to Philip, and he says, hey, where will we buy bread so that these people can eat? He leans over, and he's asking Philip, where where are we going to get enough to feed these people? Jesus is asking his disciple, where we'll get enough to feed these people. The creator and sustainer of the whole universe is asking one of his followers, what are we going to do? Now, the scripture goes on to to give Philip's reply. Listen to this. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them could have just a little bit. So Philip looks at what they have And he says, we have 200 denarii. Denarii is like a day's wage. We have enough income for 200 days. So 30 times or divided by 200 divided by 30. You know, I'm on, I'm on uh, day 12 fasting brain. And so that's basically 30, 60, 90. Let me do Hager funny math. 30, 60, 90, 120, 150. 180, almost seven months worth of provision of wages in order. That's what they had. That's what he had. That sounds like a lot. Um, Jesus wasn't broke, in other words. And Philip looks and basically says, this is what we have in the account. But even if we spend everything that we have, we can only buy enough for each one to have a little bit. 
So his immediate go-to when the need was great was based on what they have and its limitations. And they had a lot. They had enough to feed everybody maybe a little bit. Then one of his disciples, verse 8 said, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad, there, there is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many? So Philip says, We have a lot, but it's not enough. Andrew says, There's a guy with just a little bit, but I don't know if it's enough. Now, this whole thing was provoked by Jesus to test them and test their response. Because if you look back, it says in verse 6, He said this to test them, for he himself knew what he would do. You see, there are times when we're faced with great obstacles, we're big challenges that look impossible, and Jesus is waiting on us to respond to him on what we what we'll do because he already knows what he would do and in our situation he knows what he would do he knows what he's willing to do he knows what he's able to do he's asking us to see do you know what i would do and are you going to do what i would do jesus didn't ask this because he didn't know he asked his disciples so that he could test them to see where their faith is at, where their eyes are at. Philip's immediate response was on his own resources, their own natural resources, and their insufficiency. Andrew was somebody who was a networker. Andrew is the one when he met Jesus, he went out and found Peter. And he said, come, come, and, come and hear him. He's Peter's brother. So Andrew is always somebody who is able to take, uh, to recognize who Jesus is and, and invite others to him. So he brings this young kid, this lad that had some loaves of, of bread on him. And maybe that guy, that kid was just like sneaking through camp. We don't, we don't know. But Andrew saw that and he's like, hmm. He had like a faith accident right there. And he thought about, hey, this kid has 12 loaves of bread. And for a moment, his faith was alive on the inside. It was like a seed. It was like seed faith. It was like the, you know, the size of a mustard seed. Just a little glimpse of faith on the inside of Andrew at that moment. And he sees this kid and he's like, man, this kid, he has these 12 loaves. If we bring those out and, uh, and then just the natural thinking started to kick in. But what are these among so many? But yet he had the seed faith and he spoke it out and he presented that to Jesus. We have this great need. You're asking what we would do. Here is a seed. Here is a small amount that we can bring to you and feed them all. You see, Jesus latched on to Andrew's faith because that's what he would do. Jesus knew what he would do. What would he do? He would take the little that he had and he would look to heaven and he'd give thanks for it and he would bless it. And then he would use that. And that's exactly what he did. I think it's interesting. I wonder, the scripture says, Jesus knew what he himself would do. I wonder though, if he would have never done it. I wonder if it's possible that if they only came up with these ideas and said, well, we can spend all our money. And that's the best idea that he had if Jesus would have let him do it. And, and those people would have all had a little bit to eat. If all his disciples would have said, you know where, what, there's no way that we have enough to feed them. I wonder if they would have all went hungry. Because Jesus, he responds to faith. Maybe he would have stepped up and said, listen, guys, I'm trying to teach you something. This is what I would do. See that kid over there? Bring him to me. Take, take that food. Take that bread. Take those fish. I'm going to bless them right now. I'm going to give thanks. And then you go distribute them. That's what we do in situations like this. Maybe that's what would have happened because they were in training. But now they've been trained. And now we look at their training and we're, we're, um, we are being tested in our situations. 
What will you and I do when you're faced with a situation that is beyond you, uh, a ministry opportunity that you don't have the funds for, when you're faced with a financial need that goes beyond your capacity, when there's, there's an opportunity that you're not qualified for, what will you do for that? What will you do when you need a miracle in your life? When there is an opportunity to give and support a missionary, but you don't have the means to give them, what will you do? Jesus knows what he would do. He knows what he'll do in your life. He is waiting to, and he is listening for what you'll say. Be very careful of what you say. Don't be like Andrew or, or Philip. Philip would have spent all their money and it wouldn't have had a huge impact. Here's what's awesome. They didn't have to spend any of their money. All they had to do is take this little seed that came from that kid. Maybe that was a lot to him. That was all he had. It was extravagant. And Jesus took those um, loaves of bread. We don't know. Is that a random kid? Is it one of the disciples' kids? Is it some kid that belonged to one of the ladies who supported Jesus' ministry? We don't know who that was. But Jesus, when he heard what Andrew said about that kid, he said, okay, make everybody sit down on the grass. So they sat down. There's about 5,000. And then when he took the loaves, he gave thanks. And then he distributed those 12 loaves to the disciples. And uh, th those disciples then distributed it to those sitting down. And likewise, the fish as much as they wanted. This is how God provides. He didn't provide for them the way Philip said, where everybody gets a little bit. That's not his heart. It's not his heart for you. It's not his heart for those you serve. It's not his heart for the ministry. It's not his heart for his children. He provides in a way that is not just enough, but is as much as they wanted. Hey, do you want some more? Here's more. You want some more fish? Here's more fish. You want some more bread? Oh, you already had some? That's all right. There's seconds. There's thirds. We will keep serving. We will have enough as much as you want. This is, this is why when people say God, that Jesus was poor, they don't read their Bibles. They have no idea what they're talking about. They heard somebody say that somewhere and they go and repeat it, but they've never actually read themselves or their eyes are blind. Does a poor person have the ability to feed 5,000 people and as much as they want? Let me tell you something. I have fed a lot of people in my life, but I've never fed 5,000 people. I, when I say I've fed, I've cooked for, you know, uh, groups of people. I've been part of that. I'm not even the, the one who's done it all. Uh, I have, I have provided meals and invited people to my home and provided meals for, for pretty good sized groups, but never 5,000 people. And let me tell you something. Feeding four kids costs a lot of money. A poor person is not going to feed 5,000 people as much as they want. You know, as, as a as a parent, sometimes you make the food and you're like, hey, make sure, you know, everybody gets their first helping before you take your second helping. That's not what happens here. It's not how God operates. He has no lack, no scarcity. He has no poverty mentality, an abundance. There's provision. And whatever he is calling us to do, he said, there is more than enough in my kingdom. There's more than enough. Have them sit down and, and, and give them the food. Now, I don't know when that bread and, and fish multiplied. I don't think Jesus blessed it and then all of a sudden it went boop, 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 boop. I don't think that's what happened. He had those loaves and, and, and those fish and he gave them into the disciples' hands just what he blessed. I don't think that anybody saw the multiplication of it. But now they have these baskets divided up and every time the disciples would reach and reach and reach and it just never ran out i've heard miracle stories about that in our time so it's not just in the bible and many of you have experienced the provision of god that went beyond your own capacity this is how good he is he can do it for five thousand he can do it for a family of five as much as you want and then this is something else that that stood out to me as you keep reading it says so when they were filled so they had as much as they wanted and they were full it's amazing how these food passages all stand out to me during the during the fast. But when they had filled, uh, when they when they were all filled, he said to the, his disciples, "Gather up the fragments that remain, so that nothing 
is lost. Therefore they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with fragments of the five barley loaves, which were left over by those who had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, they said, truly the prophets come into the world. Um, first of all, he said this, gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. There were leftovers. There were leftovers. So it is, it is, um, it is not God's will for us to say, you know, I just want enough for me and my family. That right there is self-centered. It's a lack of faith. It's ungodly. It's demonic. How about that? We say that. I just want enough for me and my family. That is not what God has put you on the earth for, for just enough for you and your family. God has put you on the earth to be a blessing, to have an abundance so that those around you can have as much as they want and be filled and you, there will still be leftovers. You don't have to live from the bottom of the barrel. God said you can live from the top. Sometimes people say, they talk about their days when they didn't have any money and they said, oh, we were just living by faith back then. Well, what are you living by now? If you're not living by faith now, then, then you're just living by your own natural ability. Are you saying you don't need God? That's not how we operate. You know, it takes just as much faith to, to drive your car and, you know, live on an empty tank and barely getting by as it does on a full tank. You can believe God for a full tank, not just enough money and enough gas to get to the next station. You can believe God that your tank will never dip under half a tank. So whenever it gets under half a tank, you just fill it back up. Believing God for that provision. You can live by faith and have an abundance left over and nothing would be lost. Think about it. That's Bible stuff. That's not some preacher. That's not some good idea, someone, someone's self-centeredness or self-seeking. This is God saying, that's how I operate. Jesus wanted everybody to have as much as they could eat until they were full and there would still be leftovers. Leftovers. This kid gave out his, all that he had. And when he was done giving it out and it multiplied, he had everything back again and then some. Look at that. This is how God operates. So all of that to say, you're faced with a situation in your life that, that exceeds your um, resources on hand to fully fund it, fully satisfy it, fully accomplish that. Sometimes it's money. Sometimes it's skill. Sometimes it's people. Sometimes it's access. Um, so, you know, sometimes it's knowledge, whatever it is. But there is a limited amount that you have on hand. And, uh, and if you gave all of that that you had on hand, you know that in and of itself would not be enough. So you have to take what you do have with faith and put it into the master's hands. You take that seed and you recognize this isn't enough. It's basically seed, but I need a harvest. So you take what you have and you put it into the master's hand. Sometimes it's not even... Oh, I'm going to take this uh, small amount and I'm going to put it towards that. That's not always faith. That's not always what God's telling us to do. Maybe you're wanting to buy a house. Well, a house is, you know, $500,000. You need to buy a house. Well, maybe you start off with, God, who else is looking to get into a home? I'm going to take the small amount that I have and I'm going to sow it into their life. I'm going to help those people out. I'm going to bless those people over there. And you might look at it and think, well, gosh, that's not going to get me closer to buying a house. That's going to get me further away because I need the down payment. I need the deposit or the whole amount. Maybe you could believe God for the whole amount. Well, that's a seed that you're sowing so that you'll reap a harvest. This is why tithing is so important, by the way. Tithing is that it keeps the open windows of heaven from God so that there's a continuous flow in our life. And tithing is not just some great step of faith that we take. Tithing is the entry point to our financial covenant with God. A thousand dollars comes into my hands. A hundred dollars goes to the Lord and it goes to my, the storehouse where I, my local church, that's where I start off at. And so we sow our, we sow our seed to the local church. We sow our seed through, or I should say through. We also sow our seed to other people. 
But our tithe goes to the Lord. It's not to, uh, hey, I want to give to the missions. I want to give to benevolence. I want to help those people out. And that's my tithe to you, Lord. No, we bring that to the storehouse. We bring that to Jesus through our local church. That's how God has established things to operate. Beyond that, though, that's your seed. That's your seed. If you even look at it in this passage here, and I know that I'm, I'm, a, I'm tapping into some things right now, because that denarii, the $200 denarii, that was their operational fund for the ministry. That's what they were operating off of. They, Jesus didn't even have to tap into that. He took somebody's seed that they sowed and he multiplied that. And that was able to um, bless over 5,000 people and the person who sowed it. And it blesses us today because we hear that testimony and we see it. And I just wonder what have you sown in your life? What seeds have you sown? You should expect a harvest. What is it that you've taken that seemed so little at the time and you gave it to the Lord and he's done much with? And some of you have taken the little you had and in faith and sowed it and you forgot about it. And God says, there's a harvest for you. God is not mocked. Whatever a person sows, that shall he reap. So this is something that you've got to, you've got to know. If you have sown seed, if you have given the little that you had to the Lord, know this, that there's a great harvest that comes with it. But our faith has to be attached to it. That's what Jesus would do. This is what he is saying. I know what I'd do, but what will you do? I know what I would say, but what will you say? I know how I would respond, but how will you respond? And when we line ourselves up with how he responds, that sets us up for an abundance. So what difference does a little bit make? It makes all the difference in the world. Ask God what he would have you do and do it. Ask God what he's put in your hand to sow and sow it and do it now. Don't wait. God bless you. I love you. I'll be back with you tomorrow.